Awesome. Thanks so much, Kelly. Um, welcome, everybody. Delighted to see you all today. We're going to talk about uh, managing pain in pregnant women with opiate use disorder. Um, just want to remind folks that I am a specialist in addiction medicine, so I do not deliver babies. And I'm always very clear to tell my patients that you do not want me delivering your baby. Because last time I did that was about 20 years ago in training. Um, so I, I encourage folks to participate. I, I do a lot of this sort of counseling around pain issues. I certainly do a fair amount going into the pregnancy and see if there's issues that come up that require, or sorry, going into the delivery, if there's issues that come up um, regarding pain and a lot of postpartum um, pain management stuff. But I do not, I'm not in that sort of intrapartum uh, period. So if anybody who actually, you know, is involved in that process wants to add anything um, to the lecture, by all means, please do so. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we're going to talk just what Liz had laid out, um, pain management options during the intrapartum period for pregnant women, and then evidence-based recommendations around continuing buprenorphine um, during the, peri the perioperative period. I have no disclosures, as Kelly already mentioned. Next slide, please. So I wanted to think about when I set out to do this lecture, I've given this lecture a lot before, but I tried to think about it really in the context of this ECHO series, which is that there's a you know, huge array of specialties that are present, which is one of the many things that makes this awesome. Um, so a truly intra-professional group of folks. So wanted to sort of make it usable for everybody. And when I think about pain and um, patients with substance use disorder, I think of collectively our most important role is reassurance. So really being present for mom and being aware that this is oftentimes something that creates a significant amount of fear, around, of shame, you know, just all kinds of stigmatizing stuff comes into play. So I think what's really important is to just have the conversation with your patient early and often. So um, support your patient's expressions of concern about how pain is going to be managed or not managed. Uh, is there fear often? And then sort of endorse self-advocacy. So. What I really try to encourage patients is to, to, to have the courage to speak up, that we're here to help them, um, that all women who experience childbirth uh, typically experience pain. And this is a normal phenomenon and we wanna be here to support you and help you and take care of your pain. Um, so really try to normalize it and reassure them that we want to hear from them if they're experiencing pain and we will absolutely help them with that. I also put in some of the most common questions that come up for women. And so in some um, proposed responses, this is from the state opioid uh, guidance that has um, been written. Um, and I provided a link at the end uh, it's through the Maine State Clinical Opioid Advisory Committee. So one of the most common questions is, will I get high if I take pain medications while I'm on buprenorphine? So that's a real fear for women. They feel like, you know, I that could be so triggering, you know, I haven't felt high in years, I haven't, you know, used any illicit substances, so am I gonna feel high if somebody prescribes me oxycodone? And that's really, a, it's an important fear that they're experiencing. So actually we tell them that taking buprenorphine lowers the possibility that you'll feel high. So in fact, I really try to explain to women that buprenorphine bonds to that re opioid receptor very, very strongly and really prohibits that, um, euphoric effect of other opioids. So, you know, you can use pain medications and there's no possibility that they're going to feel high, which is again, a common uh, fear because it would potentially be quite uh, triggering. The other question I run into a lot is, will I go into withdrawal if I take pain medications while on buprenorphine? Another really common question. Um, so we can, the answer is no, we can absolutely take care of your pain um, while you are on buprenorphine. I think what's they use together, they can certainly be used safely. I think what's common for, for women is that you know, prior to entering treatment, they may have sort of gone on and off. So they might've been using opioids on the street, um, used street suboxone for a period of time, then gone back to opioids. And it's sort of that going off and on that can precipitate that pretty severe withdrawal. So pa patients will have experienced, okay, I used, someone gave me a suboxone film one time when I had taken some heroin and I got really sick. Well, that's because of the sequence of events that they that they used it. So they had all this, this heroin on board, they used buprenorphine, it pushes all the heroin off and really binds tightly. So that's what precipitates the withdrawal versus having that buprenorphine already on board, it's sitting on all the receptors and you can put on something like oxycodone to bind to the rest of the receptors to treat the pain. Um, but again, that buprenorphine blocks the euphoric effect. So really kind of explaining the process because Typically women have, will have experienced withdrawal when they've kind of used the two simultaneously together. So it's all about the sequencing and just sitting down and explaining that to mom is really helpful. Next slide, please. 
Um, so another common fear, I'm afraid my providers are going to think that I'm a drug seeker. So that'll be the term that they'll often use if I tell them I have pain. And again, that's the reassurance, the importance of self-advocacy. Nope, we absolutely want to hear from you. We want to be aware of what's going on because we want to take care of you. Another common question, will I be at higher risk of relapse uh, or returning to opioids if I use pain medications? Another common source of fear, like, oh my gosh, if I take this again, I haven't used anything like this in a long time. Um, am I going to then not be able to stop using when I get out of the hospital setting? Um, and actually the literature really clearly supports that the risk of relapse is higher if the pain is not adequately managed. So not surprisingly, if you, you know, are experiencing extreme pain, you're gonna want to, to address that. So it's very, very safe to be able to use it. And in fact, your risk of relapse is higher if you don't manage your pain. Another question, what if I'm triggered by taking pain medications at home after surgery? So this, this could be a situation where patients feel like, oh, I don't know if I wanna take that entire bottle of oxycodone home after the surgery. It might be because they fear they themselves might use it uh, inappropriately. Sometimes it's a fear that someone in their home might use it inappropriately. Um, so I really encourage people to quote unquote safety plan their prescriptions. Um, and so think about, you know, and I try to do it, it, it can be a hard conversation to have because you don't wanna suggest that, that someone's going to misuse it. But I usually just ask, do you have any concerns about having, you know, prescription opioids in your home and let them kind of take it from there? I mean, oftentimes they'll be like, yeah, you know, I'm really, really worried my boyfriend might use it. And then they of course can't use it for their own pain. So having a conversation, is there a safe way to take care of this medication? I had a situation somewhat recently where the woman you know, stored it next door at her mother-in-law's house. That felt like a safe um, situation for her. So lock boxes, those kinds of things, and you know, making sure that it's out of reach of children, um, but just having that conversation to see if there's any concerns. And if there's no concerns, she'll say that. I don't have any concerns. Next slide, please. So what's the evidence? That's also a really important part of the ECHO series is to make sure you all know the latest evidence it is incredibly exciting for me um, that there is finally a multi-society expert panel of recommendations. Um, this continues to be a clinical conundrum is the word I like to use. In some ways it's more straightforward during pregnancy because there's been so much literature out there, you know, do you stop the buprenorphine? Do you continue the buprenorphine? Do you reduce the buprenorphine dose to some other, you know, eight milligrams if they're on 16? There's been all this sort of guidance that's been somewhat inconsistent, difficult to use. The nice thing about pregnancy to some extent is that it's often unplanned, right? Like in terms of the delivery. So if you're gonna go in and have a stat C-section, you can't be like, you know, two days before your emergency C-section, please reduce your dose of buprenorphine. Like that's not a thing because it's not planned. Um, so in many ways, it's somewhat straightforward, more straightforward in pregnancy because it, it's not particularly well planned. Um, so, but there's a great statement and it's the Cohan paper right at the end and we will send it out afterward, but it came out about a month ago. It is a group of anesthesia, pain management, substance use disorder and pharmacy specialists. So what's awesome about that is like, it's, it's not just one group saying this because for a long time, anesthesia said this and then substance use disorder people said this and then pain was somewhere over there. So there was all these conflicting recommendations, different societies did something different, very confusing for patients. You know, I tell them one thing and they go and then the anesthesiologist tells them something different. Um, so it's really nice that there's this global um, recommendation. So in terms of how I list the recommendations, most of them fell into the category of a grade B recommendation recommendation, which is that the recommendation that this is the treatment offered, that there's pretty good certainty that the benefit's going to be moderate or substantial. If it's anything different than that category B, I've noted that. Um, so as we work through this, so planning in the preoperative prenatal period, buprenorphine should not be discontinued um, because adequate analgesia can be achieved. So that's a really important thing. So I tell my patients, if anyone tells you you're supposed to stop taking your buprenorphine before coming in, come talk to me or let me know and I'll reach out to them. I think across the state, really the standard has become continuing people on buprenorphine, but that's only been true you know, we've done it forever at Maine General, but you know that's only been true for the last probably couple of years at you know Maine Medical Center, um, and then you know some other places they, in some cases they still recommend stopping. So I encourage um, patients to talk to me if that's the advice they receive. Discontinuing buprenorphine can increase the risk of OUD recurrence or harm. It's if, if any of you have ever actually tried to do this, it's, in, it's very difficult. Patients try to taper off. You try to, you know, increase their other dose of opioids to cover this opioid debt. And it's very, very complex. And I think that the biggest issue is that 
if they're discharged home on pain medications and they don't have any buprenorphine on board, that transitions of care can be really, really challenging. You don't want to be in a situation where somebody has nothing. Um, and so really, it is no longer recommended to discontinue buprenorphine. It also, re they recommend that you shouldn't routinely taper the buprenorphine dose. So there was, again, this recommendations from some of the organizations that said, you know, well, you should taper any dose above eight milligrams down to eight because it theoretically opened up more receptors for which, you know, pain management could be applied. Um, I never found that worked particularly well. It was confusing for people. And then again, there was this sort of opioid debt that you had to make up for because there was that amount of, of medication that they were receiving above eight milligrams. So it got very confusing. So the moral to the story is continue the patients on the buprenorphine at the same dose, and that really is the standard of care. Um, I've already mentioned that, you know, again, there's additional receptors out there for pain uh, medications to attach to to achieve adequate pain relief. Next slide, please. Um, more planning. Um, so I already mentioned this, but precipitated withdrawal is a risk only when buprenorphine is newly introduced. So that's what I was talking about earlier, that when you have a patient who has no buprenorphine on board, they have opioids in their system and they take buprenorphine, that's when they get sick. It's not the case uh, for patients taking buprenorphine who then receive the full agonist opioids. So it's very important to talk your patients through that. There's literature out there that you should avoid Nubane and Stadol given the possibility of drug-drug interactions. Some of these I'm told are not even used really anymore, but it's in the literature, so I provide it to you. The buprenorphine does not provide adequate pain relief, um, nor does the methadone used in the treatment of OUD. So that's another really important piece. Some people will say, well, you have opioids already in your system. You don't need any more than that. That's not true. Um, they definitely need more um, opioid medication to achieve adequate uh, pain control. Um, if the patient is on methadone for opiate use disorder, you should confirm the dose with the outpatient uh, treatment program um, prior, ideally as early as possible in the hospital stay, um, and then continue that dose throughout the hospitalization. One thing to note, if your patient's on naltrexone or Vivitrol, um, you know, I, I always give the inpatient team the heads up. So I had a situation, it was probably about two weeks ago, patient had an alcohol use disorder, she's on naltrexone, um, which is an opioid antagonist, um, for those of you that are not aware. And so really important that you don't give opioids to somebody who's on naltrexone because then you will make them very sick. Um, so I just called up to the OB floor and said, hey, heads up, you know, patients on naltrexone. You know, I was sort of hoping the electronic medical record would scream at them if they tried to use opioids, but you don't want to, you know, don't want to rely on that. And you also know that, you know, for those of you that prescribe, I mean, you get warnings every time you enter anything. So sometimes you get a little like warning fatigue. Um, so I try to give the patient team a heads up. Um, they will, the patients will sometimes be nervous about this, but I reassure them you can still have an epidural. There's all kinds of other um, pain management techniques that we can use. Next slide, please. Um, so treatment in the post-operative period, again, this is the recommendations from the multidisciplinary um, panel, um, a multimodal approach, including other medications and regional anesthesia, so epidurals, they have these things called the TAP block, uh, peripheral nerve blocks, there's a lot of places that are using things intraoperatively like ketamine and lidocaine infusions. We just finished a study that looked at um, spinals with morphines that were incredibly effective in patients with substance use disorder. So again, there was this ongoing question with spinals with morphine, whether or not you could use opioids in that way because of the whole question with buprenorphine. But that's been incredibly eff in, uh, effective. So that's one of the things that they're using probably the most. Um, you can use non-steroidals, acetaminophen, muscle relaxants, topical agents, um, you know, things like gabapentin potentially. I don't love gabapentin, but that's an option. And then there's also all the non-pharmacological um, techniques that don't forget those, ice and relaxation, mindfulness, specifically peer support was recommended, which I loved. Um, and that could be a doula, that could be a peer support specialist, or just distraction from the pain. So there's a lot of other things you can do beyond just medications. Um, again, this uh, group recommended full mu agonists with high affinity for the mu opioid receptor. So typically that's fentanyl um, and its derivatives or hydromorphone, which is dilated. Um, higher dose is likely required, um, but it does not appear to be associated with the maternal buprenorphine dose. So we don't necessarily see that women who are on eight milligrams need a different amount than 16. It's just that they probably need more than somebody who wasn't on any buprenorphine. Don't forget that if it's an outpatient prescription, you probably have to do a prior authorization. So it's just important for folks to remember that. Um, now the group did say for 
evidence level C. So not totally clear this is beneficial. They did say for select patients only, consider increased and or divided doses of buprenorphine. I've never found this works particularly well, but I have done it a few times when patients have said flat out, no, I'm not taking any opioids, end of story, like don't even talk to me about it. Um, and so I have increased the dose of buprenorphine in those situations. It, it's kind of like a last resort thing for me, like if they won't do it and I'm really worried about their pain, um, I really try to work on what's the concern about not doing it and try to address it from that angle. But this is a recommendation in some cases you might consider. Next slide, please. Um, discharge planning. So you taper off the full mu agonist uh, used for pain and continue or return to the post-operative dose. So that is a recommendation A. In other words, you definitely should do that all the time. Net benefit is substantial. Um, engage in ongoing collaboration with the patient's outpatient buprenorphine prescriber, also level A. I mean, it makes sense, right? You want to get these patients as stable as possible and you want to coordinate care when they um, depart. Safety plan the prescription, as I mentioned. Um, safe storage is big. Um, Narcan at home, don't forget to always be thinking about naloxone co-prescribing all the time. Naloxone kick kits do expire, um, and then pe people don't always check that, right? I mean, and they're often only good for a year, and so sometimes I'll say, do you have naloxone at home? Yeah, I got it two years ago at the Opportunity Alliance or whatever, and so that's not, you know, that's probably expired at this point. And then really talking about safe medication disposal. So if you don't end up needing all your oxycodone, um, what do you do with that, and where do you take it? Uh, how do you dispose of it safely? So just walking through all those things with your patient. Next slide, please. And these are the resources. So um, I will happily send a paper. So the second one down is this amazing multidisciplinary panel patient or um, statement, which again, I'm super excited about, mostly because this has been so inconsistently managed over the course of the last decade. I realize not everybody will be quite as excited about this, but I was really excited about it. Um, and then there's some other um, statements. There's an ACOG uh, group uh, statement, the first one, and then there's some actually a really good piece on UpToDate if um, obstetric anesthesia for patients with OUD. So those of you that have um, access to UpToDate, that's a good option. And then the um, resource I mentioned from the Clinical Opioid Advisory Committee. So it's just a position statement on perioperative pain management, not specific to pregnant women, but a lot of the things are the same. So that can be useful. And I find things like that, particularly if you're running into a scenario with a specialist that doesn't want to listen to you, sometimes it's helpful to be like, here's the guidance, um, or can I email you this paper? Um, and it's been quite helpful, I think. And, and most of the time, again, it's just lack of, of it's, it's a changing field. So it's not that anybody wants to be mean or, or, or unkind in any way. It's just that this, it's a really, truly evolving field. I mean, this position statement is huge, um, that we finally have all the specialty organizations on the same page. But again, probably their members don't even know it fully at this point. So important to advocate for your patient. So I want to be sensitive of the time. So I will wrap up there, but happy to field any questions. And again, anybody who does inpatient work that wants to add any uh, flavor to that, by all means, do so.